Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Christopher Hitchens, a man of letters. He writes a regular column for Vanity Fair and for The Nation. He's the author of numerous books, most recently Letters to a Young Contrarian and Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere. He is the 2002 Sanford Elberg Lecturer at the University of California at Berkeley. Christopher, welcome. Back. Thanks. I thanks for, say. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, and, and nice to be back. Uh, where were you educated? Well, first at a series of boarding schools for boys, prep schools. I was sent off when I was about seven mm -hmm. to boarding school because family kept moving around. The first place I remember actually is Malta, mm -hmm. where the British Navy still had a big base in Valletta. It powerfully influenced me. I think my first memory is the Grand Harbour at Valletta because I've always spent a lot of time in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, and always felt kind of happy there. And maybe it's because of this first memory. But anyway, we kept shifting. So boarding school was the solution in those days. I was the first member of my family to go to a private school. Um, one of these was a, a school basically for the children of officers and Navy and Army people on Dartmoor, Devonshire. And then I went to a school, another boarding school, a Methodist-run boarding school in Cambridge between the ages of 13 and 17. And then I got to, from there to Oxford University to, to read philosophy. And, uh, it's in England, this is called a conventional education, I think for the reason that it applies to only about 1.5% of the population. <laughs> uh, you, you've called yourself a rooted cosmopolitan, uh, uh, you dem uh, and you speak of a potentially democratic and cosmopolitan patriotism. This, 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 this in a way, harkens back to this background you just described. Uh, y yes, I can't believe, especially as you put it like that, that it does not in some yeah. way, because if you're partly English, well, I suppose in a way I'm wholly English. I mean, one of the things about that is you don't have much of an identity crisis. Okay? <laughs> I don't know why it is, but we don't. It's, in fact, the subject is, the, the term is thought rather laughable <laughs> in, in English life. But if you, if you have, have an admixture of... <coughs> refugee, rootless cosmopolitans in your life um, and in your family background. And if your main impulse, as mine was, I discovered quite young, to move to the United States, somehow I always knew I wanted to do that. felt like I'd been born in the wrong country, even though I, I love it and mm -hmm. uh, feel at home there. Yeah, this is, this is having both roots and cosmopolitanism. I think, by the way, everyone should be so lucky. That's how I, that's how I hope globalization plays out, that everyone knows where they come from and are secure in that knowledge, but nobody has to stay put if they don't want to. Can you tell us about any politically uh, formative experiences uh, uh, early in your life that, that really, uh, whether before you went to college or, or, before you, or after you were at the university, that, that really pointed you on the trajectory that your politics took? Well, the background noise to my childhood, my boyhood, was the collapsing scenery of the British Empire, the, the last stages of it. Mm -hmm. And the subsequent defeat in 1964, when I would have been, I suppose, uh, 15, um, born in 49, of the long, long reign of the post-war you know, Conservative Party. Um, and my, the way I approached that was as follows. My parents had been, especially my father, politically very conservative, but as far as I could see, they got nothing out of being conservative. It seemed, <laughs> seemed rather as if they, they were being taken for a bit of a ride by mm -hmm. the monarchy, the empire, the Tory party, and so on, the class system. They, they, I couldn't see where they got their share of it. Mm -hmm. So I had a sort of rather pitying attitude to their politics, I suppose. And I, I think that, therefore, must have influenced me in looking as soon as I was old enough to make any inquiries to the left for company and for solutions, and, and on the whole, finding them. I mean, particularly reading the, the novels of George Orwell about the lower middle class, I remember impressing me very much, well, this guy knows what it feels like in my family, and he sees the contradiction. 
Um, but so there's no, there wasn't a formative moment or a, a, a Damascus moment, I don't think. Though I can remember deciding after reading a book by Arthur Kerstler when I was quite young about capital punishment that I was that I was very much opposed to the death penalty. I'm making that that's my first conscious political decision, and I didn't realise, but that was that was also go going to put me in a very much at odds with the milieu in which I'd been brought up. Now, you, in your new book, you call yourself a, a contrarian, and uh, well, my uh, publisher does. So your your publisher does, <laughs> okay, uh, and and but in in, a, in identifying or uh, accepting that label, you seem to be saying you're born to it. Uh, it's in you to be that way. Uh, is that true? I mean, do you feel that about yourself? Well, if you'll forgive just a moment of vanity, part of the, that book of my letters to a young contrarian consists of an argument with my publisher about why I, <laughs> I about why I still think the title sucks. <laughs> I see. Uh, because I think the word contrarian has something cringe-making about it. I see. It's a bit like being a licensed jester or a permitted <laughs> a permitted uh, uh, awkward customer or bad boy or loose cannon. Although we have uh, an interesting wealth, very interesting to me. Uh, the profusion of condescending terms we do have for, for uh, dissent. But as I also point out, if you say you're a dissenter or a dissident, you're claiming a term of honor that you can't just claim, you may have to earn. Mm -hmm. However, yes, the oppositional character, I'm certain, is innate in some people. It, I'm not sure if it's innate originally in all, all people and only manifest in some. I couldn't mm -hmm. say, but I, I do know for certain that it was innate in me and that this, I seem to have found through going through life that one na I naturally meet other people who feel the same. It's very difficult to explain, but you, you recognize the symptoms of a fellow sufferer when you encounter one. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you don't like to be put in a political generation. Uh, no, but, I didn't mind. Uh, but, but, so let me ask you, how do you think you were affected by the 60s? Well, no, I, do, I mean, I think I have no choice but to put myself in a political generation. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but I'm glad you say the 60s, because I think, I've always thought that, I wish I could find out the name of the person who said that of all the kinds of human solidarity, the generational is the lowest. <laughs> because what do you have to do except have an accident of birth? Mm -hmm. I mean, to be a 60s person, all you have to do is be born in a certain year. Like, it's like wine, <laughs> except not as good. That's uh, right. To be a 68er, however, a soissons huitar, we even have a French term for it now, mm -hmm. you have to have been someone who, in some sense, felt or saw the 68 crisis coming and was, in some sense, ready for it, or, if not that, was totally swept up in it, realized that here was a crux moment, a hinge, a hinge year. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky in that I made my decision that I thought it was going to be key in 67, I mean, the, the year I went to Oxford, actually, and joined a small uh, Trotskyist, Luxembourgist organization, which in the next year uh, quadrupled, no, much more than quadrupled its membership. In the other sense of the 60s, um, I was rather uh, cold uh, towards things like drug taking, which I think is a pathetic pursuit, uh, to the mistaking of work for play, Mm -hmm. uh, to the cult of youth, mm -hmm. to all that sort of rather bogus utopianism. I, I never felt very strongly about that. I just did think it was a year to be compared with 1848 as a European and international revolution. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think were the, the consequences of that uh, period? Uh, I don't mean to say, by the way, by that, that I was against sex or rock and roll. Right. There was a certain amount of that. Yeah. yeah. But, but a, a lot of what people are now remember, and what is now sold and marketed as the 60s, mm -hmm. so, I mean, my hair remained much the same length. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't wear any beads. Uh, as I told you, I have contempt for narcotics. That kind of stuff. And, uh, and for gurus. Mm -hmm. So, who, you know, <laughs> I, and I, I very, actually, one of the things that I spend a fair amount of time doing is defending a certain interpretation of the 60s, especially mm -hmm. the 68er, from the cheap uh, and illusory and, and often uh, bogus mm -hmm. stuff that is described as having been the 60s. And so what's and the lasting? Big, that led me to a confrontation in my life, which, I'm, I, if you don't mind, yeah, no, might, might help yeah. us focus on another question, which I'm hoping you're going to ask yeah. me, which is the main, the most famous person of my class at Oxford, or my generation, if you mm -hmm. prefer, was William Jefferson Clinton. Mm -hmm. So when people started to say, both for him and against him, well, at least he, or, or he sure does express the spirit of the 60s, I thought, no, no. 
Not while I'm around, he's not going to get mm -hmm. away with being the exemplary sexiest person. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. That's a, one of many quarrels between him and me. And, and it was because his, whatever, in whatever respect he identified with the right things of the 60s, he later renounced that identification. And when he was doing that, he was going along to get along as well, or going yeah. along to get along. Um, and yes, sure, I mean, I actually know why um, he can claim not to have inhaled, mm -hmm. because um, I remember it only too well. Uh, he, he's allergic to smoke, as it happens, but he's not allergic to brownies, <laughs> into which large numbers of leaves can be mashed and mainlined. That's right. It was a rather clever response, yeah. but shows the essential cheapness and dishonesty of the guy. Um, and he was, I would say, a draft dodger rather than an anti-war person. And in, other, in, every, in other words, he's the... He's the cheap and nasty version of something that actually was, in many ways, culturally well worth having. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think the, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, had an enduring effect from that period in terms of our outlook on the world, the 60s? Well, I think myself that, that it exposed the hollowness of the Cold War. In, in, in two ways. One, it, it said that the, there may or may not be a struggle with uh, authoritarian communism, but you can't, in the name of that, justify something like the, the devastation by chemical pollutants and napalm and phosphorus of the people of, and landscape of Vietnam, nor can you justify having in Europe governments like that of General de Gaulle General Franco, General Salazar, and General Papadopoulos, who were four European governments, and the NATO alliance and that. Point. We got rid of all them, or the 68 generation got rid of all that lot, and we at least contributed to it, stopping an unjust, aggressive war. But um, the, the people who I got to know in uh, Cuba and Czechoslovakia and Poland was also in that era, probably vindicated the promise in an even, what may now be an even more important way, and it was that the last seismic echoes of that are, I think, what took place in 1989. Mm -hmm. It's indirect and in some ways unintentional, but many of the same people who I've met then became part of the leadership of that great movement of emancipation, and also you could tell from the style of the people in the streets of Berlin and Prague and, and Poland that year, blue jeans, rock and roll, Mm. Uh, posters of John Lennon and so forth, that yes, that they had, they'd noticed that there was something liberating about this too. So in a way, the best vindication didn't come to me till I was, well, 39, 40. Mm. Um, but it was well worth waiting for. Mm -hmm. And as a man who studies history, that you, you, you were ready to wait, that, that, that it took longer than it should have. Well, Hegel says um, somewhere that uh, the out of Minerva doesn't take wing until dusk. The owls don't fly till it starts mm -hmm. to get dark. In other words, it's, I was, it's an overused image in some ways, but it's always been attractive to me because it is only at the close of an epoch that you can, you can really say that it was an epoch at all. You can give it some kind of measure and depth. And yes, I, I don't think the owls of 68 uh, became Minerva-like until 89. Mm -hmm. And um, even Timothy Gartnash, who took the same view in a funny way from a more conservative position than I did, um, diagnosed it roughly the same way, managed to do it in a hieroglyphic, and I don't believe in numerology, but if you put, if you write the letters 19, <laughs> if you write the letters uh, 69, 68 and 89, and then turn them upside down, they are the same. Mm. Mm. So when did you decide to become a writer? I don't think it was, this may sound, I hope it doesn't sound um, uh, solipsistic, but it was sort of decided for me, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe it's true of anyone who makes it their life. It isn't what you do, it's what you are. Mm -hmm. In other words, that somehow you've always known. Anyway, I certainly felt that I'd always known, not just that it was all that I wanted to do, or felt I had to do, but probably all that I could do. I, I still can't imagine what it would be like doing something else. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure I could be, say, a lawyer of some kind, but I just don't know what it would, I have no idea what it would be like. And if I was doing it, I'd feel like a, a sort of a conehead, you know, wondering if <laughs> all the people around me were noticing that he's, he's almost behaving like one of us, but he's not really one. How do they do it? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I only know one thing. Now, now you have a, a view of, uh, of uh, uh, almost a political philosophy of 
personal philosophy, and I'm just curious as to how that relates, or is it totally intertwined uh, with your your sense of yourself as a writer? You say, I think if the position of the uh, independent mind or writer means anything at all, it means acceptance of individual responsibility. Mm. Uh, so uh, talk a little about that, that, that in other words, the tra trajectory of, of uh, your, your personal evolution is, is intimately tied with the way you write and what you write. Sure, and I certainly, the form it took with me when I was much younger was that I hoped to become a voice for um, a movement, uh, that I would be one of its champions in print. Um, for a while, from between 67 and about 74 or 5, I was a member of a Marxist organization, as I told you, a rather odd a you know, post-Trotskyist, Rosa Luxemburgist group, which I'm not sorry I was involved with. I learned a lot from it. But I probably stayed too long in. And one of the things that taught me was that you mustn't become, or try and become, a party liner, however good the party may be. As a writer, you, that's a betrayal. And, and I wrote some good polemics and pamphleteering in that period. But I wouldn't want to reread any of it anymore. And nor, I think, would anyone else. Uh, so it's been partly an emancipation of myself from politics mm -hmm. has been involved here. And I suppose also more confidence that people would actually care to read something by me that wasn't just an argument. Mm -hmm. That was you, a discussion or a, re or a review or, or not about public affairs at all. You, you wrote somewhere, and I, I can't uh, recall where this was, you said, I don't think liberals make very good writers. I think liberals are always trying to have it both ways. I think it may have been in the Berlin Review, maybe, or maybe not. No, I'm sure, actually, that's from the letters. The letters, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's true. I mean, the, uh, that's part of my uh, critique of, of um, Azar Berlin who's often praised as a great stylist as well as a great thinker, is actually here is a guy who is not willing to be brave and not willing to make enemies, but who wants a reputation both for being even-handed and objective and fair-minded. <laughs> By the way, those three things do not and never have meant the same, though they're often used interchangeably. Uh, that's what I meant. It's what I put rather, I think, a bit too casually in, the, in this excerpt you, you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you write? Do you uh, 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 does it come? The words flow easily. Do you uh, uh, get your best ideas in a crowd, or do you like the solitude and the drink uh, and the quiet? I like all of the above. I probably <laughs> I need all of the above, but and I hope it doesn't sound glib to say, but I don't find the production of words very difficult either when I'm talking or writing. And indeed, uh, the only thing I find difficult is not doing it, is keeping quiet or not, or not writing. I'm not really happy when I'm not doing it. So I'm very lucky, aren't I, to be doing mm -hmm. the only thing I'm able to do, or something that isn't really even an ability. I mean, it's more like a knack. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have to qualify for it. So uh, that's luck, if you like. Uh, what more can I say? But, but uh, so w w how, how much do you, more, much more. How, how do you envision your audience as you write? Do you, do you think about that person out there? I mentioned that you, you write for both the nation and Vanity Fair. Yeah. And, uh, at, at one level, that, that sounds like two very different audiences. Maybe not. No, with the nation, I have a very good idea of the sort of people who, mm -hmm. who are reading me and indeed have met. I've been doing the column for 20 years. I've probably met quite a lot of them, quite a fair proportion of them. Not that many readers. And I know, I know exactly uh, what a nation reader is like. Um, and writing a, a column of about a thousand words every other week, which is what I've been doing for two decades, is m no more really demanding than writing a letter to an intelligent and humorous friend would be of a thousand words or so. If you can do that, you can be a columnist. And you can, and you can spare chunks of explanation because you know you know the person knows the point you're trying to make. With Vanity Fair the readership is so enormous that it's very important that I don't try and think who the audience is. Mm -hmm. That again I try and write to for everyone to read as if I was addressing an intelligent and humorous friend. Mm -hmm. Though this time I wouldn't have to stipulate as I would with the nation that that person is probably quite political and fairly firmly to the left. You don't have to make that stipulation. All you need to do is to, 
talk to everybody as you would talk to your smartest or wittiest pal. And the great discovery you make is that that's how people quite like to be talked to. If they suspect for a moment that you're thinking, well, wait a minute, there are lots of trailer park readers of Vanity Fair. I'd better put in something for them. They'll sniff you out in a second, mm -hmm. as they should. They'll know right away if you are being in the least bit condescending. And so that's how I write. Now, the rest of the time, uh, I write to please myself, actually. And I, I, write, I don't care if anyone else likes it or not. You know, I think if I like it, who knows? Um, I'll try it on the others. But I'm not trying to write to win them over, please them, or sell them anything. You, you quote Orwell uh, 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 saying the prime responsibility lays in being able to tell people what they did not wish to hear. Yes, that was Orwell's... Um, Orwell made two or three rather cryptic but very but very memorable statements about what it means to be a writer who has any oppositional character or intention, or any impatience with the reigning errors of the time. Um, and one was he said he knew when he was quite small that he had certain literary ability and what he called a power of facing unpleasant facts. I love, I wanted to call my book on him a power of facing. <coughs> the publishers again wouldn't hear of it. I'm always quarreling with publishers about this kind of thing. <laughs> Because I thought it was nicely phrased. He could have said an ability to face or the power to face. A power of facing caught my attention. Mm -hmm. Unpleasant facts. He, he found that he could look them in the face. And he thought, well, if I can, why do other people let themselves off this elementary task? Maybe I could help them to do it. Yes. Uh, the, for me, anyway, it's very enjoyable to find that I've noticed something, usually staring you in the face. Another thing that Orwell says is the hardest thing to see is what's right in front of your nose. And point it out to people and, and see the contortions they'll go through, not to see a point. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Cause, uh, Especially the intellectuals. Yeah, yeah. Who, who are good at self-deception also. Uh, they, they're either good at fooling others or themselves, or rather, if they're not good at it, they're very wedded to it. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, in, in your other book, which is called Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere, you, you uh, in the introduction, you talk about uh, the purpose of the book and of a course you uh, are teaching at uh, the New School, and you say, how often when all parties in the state were agreed on a matter, it was individual pens which created the moral space for a true argument. So this relates to what you've just said about showing things that appear not to be there. Yes, the, the name of the book that you've just kindly mentioned is also the name of a course I teach, but it comes from it uh, in um, a new school in New York. And originally it was specifically about American writers and their contribution as public figures, as ethical figures because this country is a written country. It's based on documents. It's the only republic that is. It's, you know, it is, it's composed. And therefore, it's subject to rewrites and updates and revisions. Mm -hmm. It's a work in progress. And that can be, that can be inscribed uh, on its history. For the one example I gave is this. Thomas Paine and Benjamin Rush and a few other pamphleteers and uh, polemicists did complain about slavery and proposed that it be banned in the Declaration of Independence or failing that by the Constitution. They lost. Between then and the rise of the anti-slavery movement of Benjamin uh, Lloyd Garrison and others, there's a lapse of about 40 mm -hmm. to 45 years. I, I, you can vary, but there's, there's a whole amazing chunk of time when millions of slaves are born and die on American soil and nobody mentions it. It's mm -hmm. because everyone's agreed. That argument's over. We had a quarrel about that. We settled it. We, as people would now say, we put that behind us and moved on. <laughs> um, and at the time, the main imperatives are domestic consensus and also national security against outside threats. It's in no one's interest to bring it up. And then suddenly, a couple of writers decide, wait a minute, this is a subject we can't be leaving out. Garrison is one, a couple of obscure Quakers, and then, of course, Frederick Douglass, who's one of the one of the great original American writers. But 
in between the parties and the vested interests in um, in the society, there was a complete agreement. There's, there's, no, there's nothing worth talking about. So there's that. Then there's Mark Twain <coughs> having a one-man, more or less one-man, pen campaign against American Empire in 1898, the Spanish-American War, very popular, agreed to by all parties. Twain satirizes it very bitterly, very brilliantly. A number of other such cases. Let's talk a little about the, the relationship between tr truth and power, because a, a lot of, of your writing is really shining a light on uh, power, uh, the statements of power, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, e e e that, that's really a central struggle in your work, is it not? Well, you put that rather flatteringly, I must say. I mean, it's not, it's not absent from what I say. No, I mean, I think power has to be ready to justify itself, has to be forced to do so at all times. We, we shouldn't ever make any assumption of anyone's right to rule, and we certainly mustn't let them make such an assumption, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, As for truth and power, someone who I've quarreled with quite often, Noam Chomsky, especially recently, makes the very good point that speaking truth to power may be too flabby a statement. Indeed, it must be pretty flabby because almost everyone uses it now in a rather approving way. Mm -hmm. That's always a bad sign, by the way, when everyone can say it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, why do we think that power doesn't know the truth? Mm -hmm. Why not make the assumption that it does know the truth? Um, it doesn't need to be told it, it just interprets, processes it differently. Mm -hmm. I think that's a perfectly good point. Mm -hmm. uh, truth spoken by power would be nice to see every now and then. Mm -hmm. Truth uttered by power would be good. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, that's partly what one tries to wring out of them, mm -hmm. some admission or some clarity. Now, now one of, one of the, the, the uh, areas that you have uh, focused on in, in several uh, small books are the icons uh, of uh, a popular culture or of political power, and uh, essentially uh, pricking uh, the balloon of illusion around them. Uh, Clinton being one. Uh, what, what is involved in, in, in that work program? I mean, does it flow naturally from all that you've said about yourself, a contrarian, a person who looks at things from the side? Uh, and what is it about our culture and our political system that uh, creates these icons? Well, if you, can I leave the second question yes. to the last and go back? It, it has occurred to me, though I, I wasn't fully aware of this while I was doing it, that of the three main targets that I've uh, had, or, or people have been nice enough to credit me with, mm -hmm. over the last, say, decade or so, uh, Mother Teresa, the so-called Mother Teresa of Calcutta, uh, the New Democrat, uh, Mr. Clinton, and the supposed People's Princess, uh, Diana Spencer, mm -hmm. all of which were quarrels between me and populism, between, because I think it's, it's easy to say that you distrust the government, that you distrust the state. Again, that's something almost no one will take mm. you up on. But if you say that you, you're very often pretty sure that it's the majority who's wrong, and the way that public opinion is constructed that's wrong, the way that popular mandates are construed that's wrong, then you can be accused of being an elitist or a snob and so on. And then you know you're onto something. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> What I realized was that in doing these three things, I'd re basically been settling a, an account with liberal illusions. Hmm. Okay. Wake up any liberal, or don't even wake them up, just walk up and say, hmm. you're opposed, aren't you, to religious fundamentalism? Mm -hmm. Of course I am. It was, you know, the, one, of the, one of the most okay things a liberal can say. Mm -hmm. well, well, Mother Teresa of Calcutta was a fanatical fundamentalist. I mean, mm -hmm. the, she took the most extreme line a line far more extreme than her own church on all matters of economics, of morality, of politics, of authority and so on. Uh, proselytizing among helpless people who were unable, you know, trying to bribe them with handfuls of rice into a conversion. Praising the Duvalier family because it was stood up for the Catholic interest in Haiti. Fawning on Nancy Reagan. Charles Keating of the Lincoln Savings. And all of this was right there for anyone to see. They wouldn't see it though because mm -hmm. no, no. She's a saint. She's doing work with the poor. The, always, in fact, the poorest of the poor was the mantra. Mm -hmm. 
So they didn't want to hear that she was a fundamentalist. They thought she was on our side, so to speak. Same with the people's princess, the ludicrous idea that <laughs> a, a people's position mm -hmm. can be passed on by hereditary succession. Mm -hmm. But they were sure she was, no, no, if you ask them, are you from monarchy and hereditary power? No. Is she a people's princess? Yes. Then the big white whale, Clinton. <laughs> um, what about someone who is, you know, war criminal, uh, a taker of bribes from foreign dictatorships, uh, almost certainly a, race, a rapist, plausibly accused anyway by three believable women of rape, um, executed a, ma a black man who was so mentally retarded that he was unable to plead or to understand the charges. Against him. You're against all that, right? But you're for it when it's someone who you think is a new Democrat. Mm -hmm. Well, again, you know, I sometimes think all my birthdays have come at once. Everyone's making it too easy for me. But all these targets were left alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and unguarded. So I thought, well, I'd be untrue to myself if I don't take at least a second look. But it was liberal illusions in all three cases. Mm -hmm. and, and most recently, because I, I wouldn't say that Noam Chomsky was an icon, and it would be rude to say that and untrue, and is, nor is it true that he's a guru. Uh, certainly he doesn't want to be one or a cult leader, but he does have the status of something very like a, an intellectual leader and authority among a large, very large number of people, especially on campus. I did think it was necessary to have a fight with him about the, the insinuation, no, actually sometimes the assertion, that uh, the inhabitants of the United States of America were morally equivalent um, to the membership of um, the Al-Qaeda organization. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that, that was probably the bitterest of them all. That's mm -hmm. and, and lost me the most trends. Mm -hmm. But but uh, I guess the the interesting became question becomes why do groups, whether in the case of Chomsky the left or in in Kate in the case of liberals uh, Clinton and so on, what what is the dynamic that puts these uh, icons before us? Well, it's the, um, I, I know I'm sure uh, what the answer to that is. Um, it's the same vicarious impulse as makes people think, which is my main critique of religion, that they can cast their sins, say, onto a scapegoat figure who will then take their sins away. I mean, can you imagine a more repulsive idea? I cannot. <clears throat> or a bigger abdication of what we call personal responsibility. It's a horrific idea, mm -hmm. but it's pretty preached by our churches. Um, many people don't have time uh, to follow, say, politics all the time, or as much as they should. They, they're aware that they don't, but they think, what I'll do is I'll find a candidate, I'll give him my vote, and then he can do the politics for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not going to do anything mm -hmm. about the third world myself. I can't. It's too much. It's, it's awful. I know I should do something, mm -hmm. but I can't. But here's this woman in, in Calcutta who claims to be a saint. Yeah. Well, I give, send her a quid mm -hmm. or, or a dollar, or at least pretend that I thought she was doing it, because the rich world has a poor conscience. She can get on with doing that mm -hmm. for me. And, um, or, or Princess Diana perhaps would be the auxiliary, you know, she'll look after the crippled children and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's being vicarious, it's letting other people lead your life for you and make your decisions for you, and you're slightly relieved, you hope you've made the right call. Uh, it's a bit like celebrity culture, actually. It's taking people and judging not their um, reputation by their actions, but their actions by their reputations. Mm -hmm. So you're living a little through them. Mm. Well, this is, I, I'm against the virtual life, I'm against the vicarious life. I think people should get a life of their own. So that's what I'm really arguing with them to do. And because of that, one can be accused of being a snob, a superior type, and so on. As I say, an accusation that increasingly delights me. It sounds like you're saying that uh, what you're witnessing there, or what is behind what you're witnessing, is an abdication of responsibility. Certainly. It's a, right. it's a, a willing surrender, I'd rather say. It's a, 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 almost a pleasurable masochistic surrender. You know, we'll leave that to Bill, mm -hmm. or Mother T, or <laughs> whoever it might be. Sure, you know, that's handing it off. Then we can go on with doing... I'm never sure exactly what they get. I mean, what, what are they doing with the rest of their lives, these people? I'm not sure. But I do know this, that... If you point out to them that they've been fooled, they just gave their savings to someone who's a swamp real estate artist, mm -hmm. they do not thank you for pointing it out. Mm -hmm. They're much more likely to blame you than the person who's just f defrauded or deceived them.
Mm-hmm. Why? Because they don't like to be told that they're gullible. People like to think that they're smart and wised up. Mm-hmm. Is it? Are, are, are you? Do you surprise yourself? Uh, in the fact that uh, uh, a British lefty has wound up in the United States uh, uh, writing uh, uh, about American politics? No, Um, not at all. Um, I mean, I think the United States is fantastically hospitable in the first place. In the second place, it's very hospitable to writers. And in the third place, this may be a privilege that, you know, it's just pure luck on my part. It's, It's very hospitable to English people. Um, and because the big secret of the United States is class and empire, okay, everyone knows there is a class system in an empire, but it's not officially admitted that mm. there is. Whereas in England, those are the subjects that we're brought up inhaling with our, the milk of our mamas. We know something about it, and we can intuit it. It's part of our instinct as well as our, as our education. Actually, it does give you a slight edge. In, in mm. arguments about about the United States, I think I think that's the key myself, rather than any literary ability, um, which is often what Americans believe. They think that the British are more elegant and ironic than they are. It's not true at all. The British are very crude mm. and very unironic, a very literal mind for the most part. But um, I don't want everyone to find out. By the way, that, that this I don't want to this trade secret. I see, I see. Long may the illusion... <laughs> because it, it long may the illusion that British people have a, sort of a, a clearer hold on the Oxford English Dictionary persist. I see, I see. But also I thought you were saying you didn't want to give the trade secrets array, that, that this, this is a field where there's a lot of work to be done. I just done. have to hope this, this channel is only watched by the elite, I think. <laughs> Which is very possible, or okay, even less. Fine. Uh, you, you said recently that, that in an interview that I saw, uh, uh, you, you're a socialist, living in a time when capitalism is more revolutionary. Yes. Uh, talk a little about that and, Actually, and what I, it tells us about your politics. Uh, can I just add to the, you know, my yeah. last point? Uh, um, Thomas Paine, the greatest Englishman of his time, and perhaps all time, was also the greatest American of his time. And, and his pamphlets probably f- first used the term United States of America. So it may be for that reason, too, that English lefties feel at home here. <laughs> Uh, and to my point then about what my own politics are, I remember writing that or something like it. I, did I, I may possibly have said, um, um, a Marxist living in a time uh, where only capitalism appears to have revolutionary potential. Mm-hmm. Because it's easier to say that I still think like a Marxist politically, because I do, it's the way I was trained. And I think the materialist conception of history hasn't been re- bettered as an explanation of the way things happen. But the prescriptive bit, what should happen, or what's going to happen, um, seems to me to have dissolved, rather. So that to say that one is a socialist is more like expressing an attitude than really a politics. And there came a time, actually, when I was writing the letters to a young contrarian, when I thought, look, this is for the young. And it actually is written to students of mine. I don't address it. But I always have them in mind, individuals, when I'm writing. Well, you, you mustn't you mustn't try and fool anybody mm-hmm. if you're going to do that. Um, you mustn't lie to the young. <laughs> and if I, if you've concluded that there is no longer an international socialist movement, that it's not going to revive, um, you're really only being a poser if you say that you're a socialist nonetheless. And that's the position I'm in now. But I miss it. I miss it like an amputated limb. I miss the fact, I miss the way that there used to be an international left, and I'm, I'm very distressed and appalled at what's rushed in to fill the vacuum of the critique of liberal capitalism, because what's filled, come in to fill that gap is much more something like um, theocratic primitivism, if not worse, fascism, mm-hmm. that is now the alternative to the globalized capitalist structure. So that's an even greater reproach, if you like. But one must look the facts in the face. What, what, how do you account for uh, the failure of the left to deal with the events of 9-11? Does it relate to this? this well, yes, I think, uh, I mean, I suppose I'll accept your question in the form in which you put it. I don't think all the left failed at this point right. at all. Uh, but yeah, the, the parts but there it. was a tremendous failure involving a large element of the left to think of it as something new, even, 
or to think of it as something dangerous. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think it honestly was, people, many people said, well, at least it's anti-globalization. Now, that should have warned people mm -hmm. of how callow and facile their critique was. They said, well, if this could be a part of it, maybe there's something wrong with your critique, man, because uh, if, never mind what the Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces want to do to you, why well, don't just take a look at what they've done to the societies they can influence? Mm -hmm. uh, societies where Afghanistan. The concept, the concept of time and the future and the past is as far as possible abolished. The first task of a totalitarian regime. Everything that isn't forbidden is compulsory. Everything that isn't compulsory is forbidden. Mm -hmm. uh, the abjection of women or another, and, and, of, and of the sexual instinct, another unfailing sign of the totalitarian impulse. The destruction of all art and culture and music. Um, and, the, and the very rapid immiseration of everyone so that the hope, I suppose, would be they would be so poor and so ignorant that they wouldn't even know that, this was a, that they were living in a bad situation. Uh, probably, however, um, there had been enough education, well, certainly, I don't see enough education, enough culture, enough experience for people to be able to survive it, but that's uh, no thanks to the people who tried to impose it. So. I personally find when there's a confrontation between everything I love, scientific inquiry, reason, cosmopolitanism, secularism, emancipation of women, so, and every, those are the things I love, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and, and everything I hate, you know, Stone Age fascism, <laughs> <laughs> religious bullshit, and so on. I find it's a no-brainer. I know exactly which side I'm on, I knew right away. I felt exhilarated on the 11th of September, I'm, so I feel slightly ashamed to say that mm -hmm. in view of the fact that so many people lost their lives that day, but when the day was over and I'd been through the gamut of rage and disgust and nausea and mm -hmm. so not fear, I will claim for myself. Um, I'm not afraid of people like that, I'm mm -hmm. very angered by them, but there was something I hadn't analyzed. I, when I went into it in myself, I was pleased to find it was exuberant. I thought, okay, right, mm -hmm. I'll never get bored with fighting against these people. And their defeat will be absolute, it will be complete. And, and it, it is because that event uh, 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 dispelled the illusions about what the adversary was up to? Yeah. Yes. In part, and because it made people value, or had the potential for making people value things like science, reason, secularism. I would prefer to say myself atheism, but no, let's say secularism. Mm -hmm. uh, the Enlightenment, the people, things that people take for granted, rather as when my friend uh, Salman Rushdie was threatened with murder for money, for bounty, by a theocratic leader on the 14th of February 1989. I thought, well, okay, mm -hmm. this is easy to decide. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of people then were saying, but you know, what about Muslim sensitivities? Right. I mean, might, may, may he not have offended some people? And I said, yeah. just listen to what you say. Uh, mm -hmm. just, just can you, do you, can you um, have any idea what you sound like when you say that? Mm -hmm. We had to put up with a fair bit of this this time, too. Um, and then I've also felt that we owed the people of Afghanistan a debt. I mean, we had let these mm -hmm. Taliban characters take over their lives in their country because they were the clients of our filthy Pakistani military clients. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, here at last one can point out to people, we have to cancel this mm -hmm. appalling debt mm -hmm. and remove this foul regime. And I'm only sorry it didn't lead to the collapse of the Pakistani one. Mm -hmm. you, you write, uh, in talking about uh, uh, our present uh, times. You say the next phase or epic is already discernible. It is the fight to extend the concept of universal human rights and to match the globalization of production by the globalization of a common standard uh, for justice and ethics. Mm -hmm. Does this help us understand why uh, a big a piece of, of uh, your enormous output is, is devoted to looking at uh, uh, human rights violations, the hypocrisy of those in power uh, with regard to those issues? If you say so, I would take it as a compliment. Yeah. I mean, the to go, to stay, rather, with globalization for a moment. It seems to me obvious, and it's been obvious for a long time, that whether you call it globalization or not, the world has increasingly become one economy. We all live in the same economy. Um, some of us a bit more than others. But it is interdependent and recognizable as such. Well, does that mean we all live in the same society? Shouldn't it mean that? No, it doesn't. Oddly enough, it doesn't quite mean that. Some of us have 
different kinds of societies within this which are better off than the others and have more claim on human rights and justice. So I think if we're going to have it, we're always being told of the benefits of it one way, we should be allowed to claim on our own behalf and that of others the, the counterpart. I mean, that's therefore what politics is to me. It isn't therefore anti-globalizing. It's cutting with the grain and saying this should be properly shared and administered. Uh, and then there's the exciting thought because of universal jurisdiction, which is a concept that's come into common use in international law now. And the abolition of sovereign immunity as a defense for crimes against humanity, that um, even the largest and most powerful and the wealthy state of them all, and the one that now most insists that there's a common standard for human rights and international law, would say, well, we would agree to apply these standards to ourselves. Mm -hmm. An elementary point, but one that needs to be fought over. And, and is that what is involved in a project like your book on Kissinger that called the trial uh, of Henry Kissinger? My campaign to get Kissinger brought within the orbit of law is something I'm very proud of, not because I think it was morally or ethically right, but because I think it was somewhat prescient. When I wrote, the, I decided if I wrote a book that was called something like Why Henry Kissinger is a Scumbag Who's Done Some <laughs> Filthy Things, for one thing, I'd still be writing it. Mm -hmm. and it would be a shelf long. Mm -hmm. that would never end. Mm -hmm. It would have to be updated every time uh, the Library of Congress or the mm -hmm. State Department declassifies a new document, by the way. There's another, there another chapter of horror each time that happens. So, no, let's, get, let's go with what we know and say, why not let's apply to this <coughs> the standards that have been established in the Pinochet and Milosevic hearings and see if they, and they do, basically. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I may have made the odd false analogy here and there, and I've been, I've had some very intelligent critiques from lawyers about how I might have refined the point, but, but generally, yes, it fits. And it involves also the, the most colossal question. Are human rights campaigns and human rights hearings and human rights tribunals and procedures to be applied only to losers mm -hmm. and or to small countries or small political leaderships? Is it just a means of cleaning up the, the nastier element of the small fry, or is it really supposed to apply to the whole of humanity? And in the case of Henry Kissinger, I could dramatize it like this. Never before has anyone this senior in, in the government of a country on the winning side of a series of wars have been asked to account for his behavior and for things he ordered and authorized and covered up. Though these are so far only tentative lawsuits, mainly requiring information, mm -hmm. they have within them the potential of... They force the question on the United mm -hmm. States and its citizens, do we expect to abide by the standards we impose on others? Well, there couldn't be a more important question than that. <clears throat> there is another motive, of course, which is I simply think that the, the mere continued existence mm -hmm. of this man in this culture and the way he's fawned on by my profession, the press, mm -hmm and another profession of which I'm a part-time member, the academy, and another profession with which I'm concerned, the publishing industry, all of whom have colluded in his lies, mm -hmm. his fraudulence, his falsified publications. That, that, that's something that, it, on aesthetic grounds alone, mm -hmm. you know, makes one determined to, to put it right. It, it sounds to me like in, in your work you're obviously a journalist, but only part journalist. I mean, the journalist who goes out and, and does the digging and finds the evidence, for example, in the Kissinger book, uh, gathers the information that is, is coming out and so on. But on the other hand, somebody who, who's really very theoretical, who, who sees a big picture and, and, and relates that research to it. I, I mean, this is an obvious point on the one hand, but on the other hand, many of your colleagues don't do that in the American press. Well, you keep putting me in this false position of asking questions which uh, uh, allow me to answer by saying, well, yeah. how, how right uh, you are to say yeah. it. I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah. There should okay. already be a statue to me in, uh, in Lafayette Square. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I find it so difficult. You're pushing an open door, I, I warn you. Uh, okay. um, it's more like this. Look, as to the digging, I mean, I acknowledge in my Kissinger book, most of the spade work uh, on the kissing and stuff was done by other people or is bought at the sacrifice of other people's lives. In other words, we, uh, we know of certain terrible atrocities 
which goes in committee. So, I mean, I'm, I'm simply assembling the raw material, which is very dearly bought. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's true, I didn't, when I thought to myself, now, wouldn't it, would it be nice to do an investigation into the crimes of a recent Secretary of State? I wonder which one. I'm sure if I dug into the life of Cyrus Vance, I'd uncover all kinds of... I didn't, I didn't need a roadmap to decide mm -hmm. which one it was going to be. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, one, one is not flying completely blind. Um, and so there's that. But by the way, um, according to the, sort of the Chomskyan worldview, I would have done just as well to investigate Cyrus Vance because they're, you know, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. It's the system, not any one individual. I, I don't quite obviously believe that. Mm -hmm. Individuals do count and make a difference, and so do individual characters. But yeah, I would, the, the reductio ad absurdum would be, why didn't I do Madeleine Albright or Cyrus Vance? I've discovered equally bad things. Not so. This is, this is a, a truly spectacular case of an international rolling crime wave associated with one man. Um, but I would look, I would far rather um, be uh, recognized or um, discussed for what I'd written in the same year about Oscar Wilde, mm -hmm. or Anthony Poe, or Patrick O'Brien. Mm -hmm or um, Arthur Conan Doyle, because th this is what I really do most, most of the time. And mm -hmm. it, it takes, it's much harder, it involves much more reading and much more thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but politics, you know, is someone no one can abstain from, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be much more than 25% of anyone's life, I don't think. And, and let's talk about this other part of your writing, which we really haven't addressed, and that is uh, a really uh, a scholarly effort uh, to understand uh, uh, some of the great writers uh, of, of, of our time. Uh, is that kind of work different, and in what ways is it different from writing about uh, public issues? Well, I mean, it's true, I, in my main collection of work on that, on that kind of topic, I do say that the public sphere of these things is always important, and someone who's got no knowledge of or interest in politics would be slightly, not necessarily blind in one eye, but perhaps a little near or long-sighted. It's necessary to have that. So if you're reviewing, say, Patrick O'Brien's wonderful sequence of novels about the Napoleonic War at sea, if you don't know something about what was going on then, and what the struggle was between the French Revolution and Napoleonic successions to it, and the British Empire, yeah, the, the novels would be that much less interesting. Um, indeed, I, I begin the argument there by saying that the, actually the Napoleonic Wars should be called the First World War. That was the first global war there ever was. But with someone like Anthony Pohl, for example, who's written this extraordinary novel sequence about English life, social life in the upper class, in the sort of the Proustian classes, in London in, um, in the 20th century, Again, if you don't know some social history, you'll be to that extent disabled. But it would be quite possible to read it, I think, for pleasure alone, just as what it reveals about human nature and human motivation. Um, he's, he's comparable, I think, to George Eliot in that way, of having some, some guess about what makes people behave the way they do and knowing what life is like. If, if students were to watch this tape, this, this uh, partial rendering of uh, your intellectual journey, uh, is there one lesson that you think uh, they might uh, draw uh, from your journey uh, 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 that stands out? Uh, well, the only ones I would think would be interested in hearing from me would be those who have writing in mind as a career. I would expect, and I do, I do draw students sometimes to my class in New York for that reason. And yes, I do have advice that may sound incredibly tautological, but isn't. Uh, you should first ask yourself if you really have to write. In other words, not is it something you'd like to do or have heard can be rewarding or enjoyable, or you think might. Has it ever occurred to you that you have no choice but to write? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's always someone, when I say this in a room full of students, who looks at me suddenly as if, how did you know that? <laughs> and that that's how I do know. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's true, then it's fine. You, it will work. You, you will get it done. Uh, you may not be a howling success at it, but at least you will know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. It's a, pl a pleasure lots of people don't have. Uh, and, and conversely, if you don't feel that, you might want to try something else. Mm -hmm.
because I doubt you'd be able to survive the disappointments that are, that are inevitable. So, it may sound to those who are not, who are immune, that that's too, or that's too easy to say, but actually it took me a long time to work it out. And I, and I found that it, it works as advice to those who need it. I also get the sense, uh, one, one final point here, that, that you really, uh, engagement uh, with the world is, is very important for you as a writer and your willingness uh, to uh, follow your thoughts where they lead and actually to change your thinking about particular issues. Is that fair? Again, it's rather, uh, if I may say so, it's rather, <laughs> it's rather generously <laughs> phrased. But. Uh, look, yes, if I, if I come up against a, a pile of evidence that makes it seem as if my first assumption was untrue, I would rather change the assumption than try and change the evidence, yes. Maybe that's why you've never gone into government. And <laughs> so that's, uh, but, but I, I do know that though what, it, it may seem obvious when I say it and flattering when you say it. I do know that for a lot of people, that isn't easy. They would rather continue battering themselves against the pile of the evidence. They really would, even if they wear themselves out. And as for going out and having a look for myself, well, I, I think it's essential. As part of being an internationalist is wanting to see how other people and societies uh, are, just are, and, and how, how they look and feel. And um, um, I think some of the happiest moments of my life as well as some of the most miserable ones have been trying to do that, from North Korea to um, the Congo, which are the two places that have depressed me most and made me see how how miserable human life can be made to be by other people, not by just the misfortunes of our, our nature or nature, mother nature, uh, to, you know, the wonderful pleasure of going back as I have to countries that I first knew when they were dictatorships or colonies and friends of mine were in jail or in exile and going back and finding them out of jail and sometimes in power, though always aware mm -hmm. that they might themselves one day. Uh, repeat the mistakes. Still, being able to have seen that happen a few times has been, I think, the, the highest of, of the pleasures that go with this kind of life. Christopher, on that note, I want to thank you and, and I hope I'll get you to come back in November when you're back on the campus and uh, at that time I'll have a set of more hostile questions. I can't thank wait. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. says um, somewhere that uh, the owl of Minerva doesn't take wing until dusk. The owls don't fly till it starts mm -hmm. to get dark. In other words, it's, I was, it's an overused image in some ways, but it's always been attractive to me because it is only at the close of an epoch that you can, you can really say that it was an epoch at all. You can give it some kind of measure and depth. And yes, I, I don't think the owls of 68 uh, became Minerva-like until 89. Mm -hmm. And um, even Timothy Gartnash, who took the same view in a funny way from a more conservative position than I did, um, diagnosed it roughly the same way, managed to do it in a hieroglyphic, and I don't believe in numerology, but if you put, if you write the letters 19, <laughs> if you write the letters uh, 69, 68 and 89, and then turn them upside down, they are the same. Mm. Mm. So when did you decide to become a writer? I don't think it was, this may sound, I hope it doesn't sound, um, uh, solipsistic, but it was sort of decided for me, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe it's true of anyone who makes it their life. It isn't what you do, it's what you are. Mm -hmm. In other words, that somehow you've always known. Anyway, I certainly felt that I'd always known, not just that it was all that I wanted to do, or felt I had to do, but probably all that I could do. I, I still can't imagine what it would be like doing something else. I mean, I'm sure 
I'm sure I could be, say, a lawyer of some kind, but I just don't know what it would, I've no idea what it would be like. And if I was doing it, I'd feel like a, a sort of a conehead, you know, wondering if hmm. all the people around me were noticing that he's, he's almost behaving like one of us, but he's not really one. How do they do it? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I only know one thing. Now, now you have a, a view of, uh, of uh, uh, almost a political philosophy, a personal philosophy, and I'm just curious as to how that relates or is it totally intertwined uh, with your, your sense of yourself as a writer. You say, I think if the position of the uh, independent mind or writer means anything at all, it means acceptance of individual responsibility. Mm. Uh, so uh, talk a little about that, that, that in other words, the tra trajectory of, of uh, your, your personal evolution is, is intimately tied with the way you write and what you write. Sure, and I certainly, the form it took with me when I was much younger was that I hoped to become a voice for um, a movement, uh, that I would be one of its champions in print. Um, for a while, from between 67 and about 74 or 5, I was a member of a Marxist organization, as I told you, a rather odd uh, you know, post-Trotskyist, Rosa Luxemburgist group, which I'm not sorry I was involved with, I learned a lot from it. But I probably stayed too long in, and one of the things that taught me was you mustn't become, or try and become, a party liner, however good the party may be. As a writer, you, that's a betrayal. And, and I wrote some good polemics, and was William Jefferson Clinton. Mm -hmm. So when people started to say, both for him and against him, well, at least he, or, or he sure does express the spirit of the 60s, I thought, no, no. Not while I'm around, he's not going to get mm -hmm. away with being the exemplary sexiest person. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. That's a, one of many quarrels between him and me. And, and it was because his, whatever, in whatever respect he identified with the right things of the 60s, he later renounced that identification. And when he was doing that, he was going along to get along as well, or going yeah. along to get along. Um, and yes, sure, I mean, I actually know why um, he can claim not to have inhaled, mm -hmm. because um, I remember it only too well. Uh, he, he's allergic to smoke, as it happens, but he's not allergic to brownies, <laughs> into which large numbers of leaves can be mashed and mainlined. That's right. It was a rather clever response of yeah. his, but shows the essential cheapness and dishonesty of the guy. Um, and he was, I would say, a draft dodger rather than an anti-war person. And in, other, in, every, in other words, he's the... He's the cheap and nasty version of something that actually was, in many ways, culturally well worth having. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think the, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, had an enduring effect from that period in terms of our outlook on the world, the 60s? Well, I think myself that, that it exposed the hollowness of the Cold War. In, in, other, in two ways. One, it, it said that there the may or may not be a struggle with uh, authoritarian communism, but you can't, in the name of that, justify something like the, the devastation by chemical pollutants and napalm and phosphorus of the people of, and landscape of Vietnam, nor can you justify having in Europe governments like that of General de Gaulle General Franco, General Salazar, and General Papadopoulos, who were four European governments of the NATO alliance and that. Point. We got rid of all them, or the 68 generation got rid of all that lot, and we at least contributed to it, stopping an unjust, aggressive war. But um, the, the people who I got to know in uh, Cuba and Czechoslovakia and Poland, and also in that era, probably vindicated the promise in an even, what may now be an even more important way. And it was that, the last seismic echoes of that are, I think, what took place in 1989. Mm -hmm. It's indirect and in some ways unintentional, but many of the same people who I've met then became part of the leadership of that great movement of emancipation. And also, you could tell from the style of the people in the streets of Berlin and Prague and, and Poland that year, blue jeans, rock and roll, Mm -hmm. uh, posters of John Lennon and so forth, that yes, that they had, they'd noticed that there was something liberating about this too. So in a way, the best vindication didn't come to me till I was, what, 39, 40. Mm -hmm. um, but it was well worth waiting for. Mm -hmm. And as a man who studies history, that you, you, you were ready to wait 
that, that it took longer than it should have. Well, Hegel globalization plays out, that everyone knows where they come from and are securing that knowledge, but nobody has to stay put if they don't want to. Well, can you tell us about any politically uh, formative experiences uh, uh, early in your life that, that really, uh, whether before you went to college or, or, before you, or after you were at the university, that, that really pointed you on the trajectory that your politics took? Well, the background noise to my childhood, my boyhood, was the collapsing scenery of the British Empire, the, the last stages of it, mm -hmm. and the subsequent defeat in 1964 when I would have been, I suppose, uh, 15, um, born in 49, of the long, long reign of the post-war you know, Conservative Party. Um, and my, the way I approached that was as follows. My parents had been especially my father, politically very conservative, but as far as I could see, they got nothing out of being conservative. It seemed, <laughs> seemed rather as if they, they were being taken for a bit of a ride by mm -hmm. the monarchy, the empire, the Tory party, and so on, and the class system. They, they, I couldn't see where they got their share of it. Mm -hmm. So I had a sort of rather pitying attitude to their politics, I suppose. And I, I think that, therefore, must have influenced me in looking as soon as I was old enough to make any inquiries to the left for company and for solutions and, and on the whole finding them I mean particularly reading the, the novels of George Orwell about the lower middle classing I remember impressing me very much that well, this guy knows what it feels like in my family and he sees the contradiction mm -hmm. um, but so there's no, there wasn't a formative moment or a, a, a Damascus moment I don't think though I can remember deciding after reading a book by Arthur Kerstler when I was quite young about capital punishment, that I was that I was very much opposed to the death penalty, and making that that's my first conscious political decision, and I didn't realise, but that was that was also going to put me in a very much at odds with the milieu in which I'd been brought up. Now, you in your new book, you call yourself a, a contrarian, and uh, well, my publisher does. Your, your publisher does, okay, uh, and and but in in, a, in identifying or uh, accepting that label, you seem to be saying you're born to it. Uh, it's in you to be that way. Uh, is that true? I mean, do you feel that about yourself? Well, if you'll forgive just a moment of vanity. Part of the, that book of my letters to a young contrarian consists of an argument with my publisher about why I, I, about why I still think the title sucks. I see. Uh, because I think the word contrarian has something cringe-making about it. I see. It's a bit like being a licensed jester or a permitted, <laughs> a permitted uh, uh, awkward customer or bad boy or loose cannon. Although we have uh, an interesting wealth, very interesting to me, uh, the profusion of condescending terms we do have for, for uh, dissent. But as I also point out, if you say you're a dissenter or a dissident, you're claiming a term of honor that you can't just claim, you may have to earn. Mm -hmm. However, yes, the oppositional character, I'm certain, is innate in some people. It, I'm not sure if it's innate originally in all, all people and only manifest in some. I couldn't mm -hmm. say, but I, I do know for certain that it was innate in me and that this, I seem to have found through going through life that one, I naturally meet other people who feel the same. It's very difficult to explain, but you, you recognize the symptoms of a fellow sufferer when you encounter one. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you don't like to be put in a political generation. Uh, no, but, I don't mind. But, but, so let me ask you, how do you think you were affected by the 60s? Well, no, I, do, I mean, I think I have no choice but to put myself in a political generation. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but I'm glad you say the 60s, because I think, I've always thought that, I wish I could find out the name of the person who said that of all the kinds of human solidarity, the generational is the lowest. <laughs> because what do you have to do except have an accident of birth? Mm -hmm. I mean, to be a 60s person, all you have to do is be born in a certain year. Like, it's like wine, <laughs> except not as good. Uh, right. To be a 68er, however, a soissons huitard, we even have a French term for it now, mm -hmm. you have to have been someone who, in some sense, felt or saw the 68 crisis coming and was, in some sense, ready for it, or, if not that, was totally swept up in it, realized that here was a crux moment, a hinge, a hinge year. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky in that I made my decision that I thought it was going to be key in 67, I mean, the year I went to Oxford, actually, 
and joined a small uh, Trotskyist Luxembourgist organization, which in the next year kind of quadrupled, no, much more than quadrupled its membership. In the other sense of the 60s, um, I was rather uh, cold uh, towards things like drug taking, which I think is a pathetic pursuit, uh, to the mistaking of work for play, mm-hmm. uh, to the cult of youth, to all that sort of rather bogus utopianism. I, I never felt very strongly about that. I just did think it was a year to be compared with 1848 as a European and international revolution. Mm-hmm. And, and what do you think were the, the consequences of that uh, period? Uh, I don't mean to say, by the way, by that, that I was against sex or rock and roll. Right. There was a certain amount of that. Yeah, yeah. But, but a, a lot of what people are now remember, and what is now sold and marketed as the 60s, mm-hmm. so, I mean, my hair remained much the same length. Mm-hmm. I certainly didn't wear any beads. Uh, as I told you, I have contempt for narcotics. That kind of stuff. And, uh, and for gurus. Mm-hmm. So, who, you know, <laughs> and I, I very, actually, one of the things that I spend a fair amount of time doing is defending a certain interpretation of the 60s, especially mm-hmm. the 68 from the cheap uh, and illusory and, and often uh, bogus mm-hmm. stuff that is described as having been the 60s. And so what's and the lasting? Big, that led me to a confrontation in my life, which, I'm, I, if you don't mind, yeah, no, might, might help yeah. us focus on another question, which I'm hoping you're going to ask yeah. me, which is the main, the most famous person of my class at Oxford, or my generation, if you prefer. Mm-hmm. Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Christopher Hitchens, a man of letters. He writes a regular column for Vanity Fair and for The Nation. He's the author of numerous books, most recently Letters to a Young Contrarian and Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere. He is the 2002 Sanford Elberg Lecturer at the University of California at Berkeley. Christopher, welcome. Back, thanks, I should say. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, and, and nice to be back. Uh, where were you educated? Well, first at a series of boarding schools for boys, prep schools. I was uh, sent off when I was about seven mm-hmm. to boarding school because family kept moving around. The first place I remember, actually, is Malta, mm-hmm. where the British Navy still had a big base in Valletta. <laughs> Powerfully influenced me, I think, my first memory is the Grand Harbour at Valletta because I've always spent a lot of time in the Mediterranean and the Middle East and always felt kind of happy there. And maybe it's because of this first memory. But anyway, we kept shifting. So boarding school was the solution in those days. I was the first member of my family to go to a private school. Um, one of these was a, a school basically for the children of officers and Navy and Army people on Dartmoor, Devonshire. And then I went to a uh, school, another boarding school, a Methodist-run boarding school in Cambridge between the ages of 13 and 17. And then I got to, from there to Oxford University to, to read philosophy. And, uh, it's In England, this is called a conventional education, I think for the reason that it applies to only about one and a half percent of the population. <laughs> uh, you, you've called yourself a rooted cosmopolitan, uh, uh, you dem- uh, and you speak of a potentially democratic and cosmopolitan patriotism. Th- this, 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 uh, this, in a way, harkens back to this background you just described. Uh, y- yes, I can't believe, especially as you put it like that, that it does not in some yeah. way, because if you're partly English, well, I suppose in a way I'm wholly English. I mean, one of the things about that is you don't have much of an identity crisis. Okay? <laughs> I don't know why it is, but we don't. It's, in fact, the subject is the, the term is thought rather laughable <laughs> in, in English life. But if you if you have, have an admixture of <coughs> refugee, rootless cosmopolitans in your life um, and in your family background, and if your main impulse, as mine was, I discovered quite young, to move to the United States, somehow I always knew I wanted to do that. Felt like I'd been born in the wrong country, even though I. I love it and mm-hmm. uh, feel at home there. Yeah, this is, this is having both roots and cosmopolitanism. I think, by the way, everyone should be so lucky. That's how I, that's how I hope.